Hi there. My name is Derek Brake and I'm a ruminant nutritionist in the Division of Animal Sciences at the University of Missouri. Today I'd like to take a short amount of time to talk about grazing cover crops. In my opinion, cover crop grazing is largely an underutilized resource across the state and beyond, which is unfortunate because cover crop grazing has a real potential to increase on-farm revenue, diversify income, and could help in expanding farming enterprises, aid in succession planning, and insulate against market fluctuations in individual, commo individual commodities. And that doesn't even include agronomic and environmental benefits that we can realize from some of these practices. So to discuss cover crops, I think an important piece is that we all understand what a cover crop is. So broadly, a cover crop is any plant that's used primarily in a cropping system to provide agronomic benefits. Now that's a pretty broad definition, so it's not super surprising that there are over 32 itemized plants and many more plant species that have been and are currently being used in cover cropping uh, systems. And this includes both warm and cool season grasses, both warm and uh, cool season legumes, uh, along with um, brassica species, things like canola, rapeseed, radish, turnip, kale, mustards, uh, broadly a mustard species plant um, that are all involved and used in, in cover crops. So odds are that many of you might be listening to me discuss this, might have heard about cover crops prior to prior to this um, video, and that's and that's good. And if you haven't, well, that's okay too. So the question is, well, why why what's all this buzz about cover crops? Well, I'm not an agronomist. Um, however, the literature that has been made available to me shows that there's relative benefits or fairly consistent benefits in utilizing cover crops to mitigate or make less bad erosion that we see in row cropping systems. It can enhance soil organic matter and it helps control plant pests and plant diseases as well. Now there's also some reports that there are improved yields in some cropping systems. However, it's really important to note that there's also data that suggests that yield results are relatively dynamic and that different cover cropping systems can influence different row crops differently. So it might be that when we evaluate cover crops purely from an agronomic attribute and their influence in food production from plants, that there, it might be that it requires more of a scalpel and less of a, a hacksaw in trying to design a optimal cover cropping system just within that. But I'm a ruminant nutritionist and I'd actually like to talk about a different aspect or a different use that we can actually use for cover crops. But before we do that, the, the other piece is that there's, the other reason why we hear about cover crops is because there's incentive programs that are made available from various federal state, at various federal state and district levels to help incentivize the use of cover crops. And this has been around for a while now. It's been around since the 1996 farm mill. And these numbers change by region or the incentives that are available um, to incentivize the use of cover crops change by region, but they're roughly in the ballpark of about $30 an acre when an individual chooses to utilize single cover crops and $40 an acre for a mixture of color crops with a maximum benefit of up to $20,000 um, of a lifetime per person. So in other words, there's, a current, there's current incentives in place um, that'll cover up to 500 acres of planting a mixture of cover crops. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, while I mentioned I'm not an agronomist, we have done some research projects where we'd have to cut, we've had to incur some of the costs associated with this when we established our experiment. And to the best of my knowledge or in my experience that a lot of times these incentives that exist out there are very near to the price or the costs that are realized in establishing that crop. Um, so in other words, we can we can basically plant the seed for for near to free. So um, when we when we qualify for some of these incentive programs, these incentive programs have been relatively uh, productive. And we're sitting in in the state of Missouri, where we are uh, sitting in a state that leads or is one of the leaders in the United States in the utilization of total acres planted, at least in the 2017 Ag Census. Um, However, when we look at this data from a county by county level, we see that even though Missouri is some of the most acres planted in the United States to cover crops, there's a lot of room to 
increase that as well. We're well below the a 15% threshold um, in many of our counties um, the, of the total acres that would be available to be planted to cover crops. And so the, when we see this, we have to ask the question, well, why is that? Why, what are the, there must be some challenges that are associated with utilizing cover crops. So, and so, you know, when I sit here and I think, well, what might be some of the challenges? Well, some of the things that come to mind to me are most of the agronomic benefits of cover crops require prolonged amounts of time to provide direct, direct economic benefit. When we use cover, when we think of cover crops as a tool in simply a plant production system, they, um, it might require years um, before you see any direct revenues or returns associated with, with that management choice. Also, a number of cover crop species that have been utilized historically, either in blends or directly, um, they seem to have been more selected more for their agronomic traits than they are necessarily for nutritive value to animals, which animals are gonna, un, are gonna hold the key to, for us to be able to realize very rapid increases in revenue and in a short window of time um, where we can realize that within the same growing year, this benefit if we decide to incorporate um, animals into a grazing system on top of cover crops. And, and so that's what I'd really like to spend a little bit of time talking to you about. So in order to figure out what the value of animals, of grazing cover crops by animals is, is we have to have, an, we have, to have some sort of indicator of their performance. And their performance is going to be broadly dictated by the diet that they eat or the diets that they select. So it's important to keep in mind cattle are not lawnmowers. So like a lawnmower that goes by and clips everything off of a pasture, cattle don't do that. Cattle select different plants. They also select different parts of different plants when they're selecting this diet. And so having a, in the plants and plant parts that they select ultimately alter the diet quality. And that diet quality is what dictates differences in animal performance. So understanding the diets that are selected by grazing cattle is important to understanding the impacts on weight gain and nutrient, and also the nutrient contributions of the cattle back to the land in these type of, in these type of systems. So part of the problem or perhaps some of the hesitancy associated with this is that there's not a lot of data available on how to optima, optimally graze cover crops um, in a way that optimizes both the benefits to the cattle, the land, and the environment from this type of management decision. And so that's been, a, that's been an area where um, my lab group has actually been focused here in the last couple of years on trying to um, ask these questions. In this right-hand pane, some of you might recognize this. This is what we would see most uh, prevalently in our state is um, for a, when we think of cover crops is we, we think of like a an annual ryegrass or a cereal ryegrass that we would that we would notice where we would see cattle in almost a pure stand of this um, and that works relatively well. It generally is a claim more from its uh, ability to stay. It's relatively easy to establish a stand. It's not necessarily the best cover crop um, when it comes to um, optimizing nutrient supply and ultimately animal performance. And that's um, a little bit less common. We might see something pictured in this middle pane, which is a, actually a mixture where we see a mixture of a grass, like a cereal rye, along with, um, rather than an annual rye, but we could also use an annual rye. And then we also mixed in with these things, these brassicas, these really broad leaf plant species that we see planted here where we have a mixture of these grasses as well. And that's, that's been an area where we've really been focused and interested in and in trying to capture value um, from these systems by, we think that these provide greater nutrient densities and ultimately greater animal performance and animal gains, which can provide greater return on an acre basis and on a per head basis um, for individuals who choose to integrate uh, grazing into a, cover, into a cover crop system. So we did a study that I'd like to talk about a couple years ago, where we made small paddocks, two and three quarter acre paddocks. We made 12 of these and we stocked it with either three, four or five animals. Um, that, those animals in that experiment were about 500 pound recently weaned heifers. We did this study for, 48, for a 48 day period. We measured things like diet selection, digestibility, nutrient quality of the plant, and, also, and ultimately performance because performance is what we get paid on. 
So I wanted to show you some of the data when we measured intake. We, we use different nutrients um, to determine at true intake of cattle as we went along by taking um, samples from their stomach. And we measured the, in, in this, we have on this y-axis, we have this ratio of brassica to grass. Um, that's not all that important. It's just understanding that as we move up on our y-axis here, that that increases the amount of brassica. So that's those turnips and radishes that were consumed by the cattle. And numbers that are lower on this scale, that would represent a diet that's consistent more with, with just grass. And then we measured this at day two, May 24, right in the middle, and right near the end on day 46, we also measured, we took measures of these diet selection. And as we moved along, we saw something that I think is kind of interesting. The, the pastures that had the least amount of stocking density in there, that's that three heifers per 2.75 acres, that we saw this linear increase in the amount of brassica that was consumed. However, when we increased the amount of grazing pressure to both four and five, that we saw a very rapid increase. Everybody was eating about the same thing at the beginning of the experiment. However, in the middle of the experiment, we saw very large intakes in brassicas among um, those animals. And then that returned back down to that low level on day 46. We think that's probably uh, due with forage availability, that the animals consumed all the brassicas or a large proportion of the brassicas, and then everybody was eating about the same diet there towards the end of the experiment, and that was just a consequence of, of the overall change in plant species that were still available for grazing. And so how do we think about this? So what's this tell us about how cattle graze? Well, when we think about it, we use our imagination or back to that mixture a little bit. When we have this standard, this kind of grass picture here, cattle will go through and they'll graze what they're used to, which a lot of them are gonna come off of it, even if it's a calf, it's gonna come off of a pasture somewhere and it's gonna have seen grass. And so we'll see the grass go off first. However, then they'll go through as, the, as that diminishes or goes away, then, we start, then they'll go into the, the leafy parts of the brassicas. And then ultimately, I like to think of them as grazing a third time. A lot of these tubers, a lot of these turnips and radishes, that exist inside of these pastures have a lot of sugar in there, which is very similar to like a cereal rye, like an oat or um, a wheat seed or, um, or corn. It's very, very nutritious to the cattle. And you'll actually see this where cows will pull this tube out of the ground and you'll see them chomp on this. And smaller animals like heifers that we used in this experiment will actually use their teeth to scrape out the insides of that. And they'll eat nothing but just the very outside skin that's left over. And so this could be associated with familiarity. It also could be a piece where there's some other uh, chemical mechanisms that are regulating this specifically. An important thing to take into consideration when we look at brassicas is that um, a lot of the blends that actually end up having brassicas end up being somewhere in the neighborhood of two thirds to three quarters of the overall material that's actually in the field or the pasture that's available to graze ends up being brassica, even though that might only be less than half of the overall seed that's in our mixture. And that's just, that has to do with the nature of these very broad leaves, these large, broad, lush leaves that come apart, come apart with these turnips and radishes compared to the grasses. Both of these plants provide very, uh, very nutritious sorts of forage that cattle can gain very relatively easily on. But what's important is brassicas will take nitrogen from the soil and they store that as nitrate. They'll fix that in their plant tissue as nitrates. Nitrates get a relatively bad rap in cattle feeding um, because cattle that are naive to nitrates can experience a certain level of toxicity. However, what's often overlooked is that if cattle are adapted to increasing intakes of nitrates that can provide a whole lot of benefit to the animal and maybe even provide some improve the environmental impacts associated with beef production as well. So um, and we'll talk a little bit further about that in a moment but ultimately I wanted to show you some of what we noticed in the performance here because we randomized the experiment um, by initial body weight. We wanted to make sure everybody weighed about the same. We didn't have any differences in initial body weight. And this is an important piece to consider when you're thinking about grazing cover crops is these are the data that are down here that I've highlighted in black below. These are um, 
these are uh, the absolute amounts of gain in that period of time. So over a 22 day, a little bit over a three week period, we only saw about 16 pounds of gain in five and five pounds of gain as we increased the stocking density. And it did go down with increasing amounts of stocking density. What's more important here is that there was, there was basically a lag phase. The cattle had to learn how to graze the cover crops. They were naive to these type of things. And as a result of that, we had reduced amounts of intakes that, associate, that were associated with that uh, period in time. And those reduced intakes didn't equilibrate to very large increases in gain. However, when we look at the last half of the experiment, we saw very large increases in gain. So, so basically after we made it through that lag phase, we, all of the cattle made very large increases in gain that associated that. And overall, we saw relatively um, large gains, something to the tune of about 70 pounds, a little bit less in the, in the five head pen, which worked out overall to a one and a half, a little bit less than one and a half uh, pounds of average daily gain across the entire group. So when we're thinking about this, when we're trying to ask that question, is this something that I want to mess with? Is this, does this have any value in my production system? I went ahead and I'm not an economist, so I'd encourage you to engage um, the folks that work throughout our extension service that are focused on economics and they can perhaps give you a much more exhaustive version of this. But from the nutrition and management aspect, which are the things I like to think about, this is kind of, um, you know, my um, back, back of the napkin kind of math here that I at least wanted to walk everybody through. Uh, in these panels here, I have the average monthly calf price that was received for the last five years, so 2015 through 2019. Yeah, um, you know, many of you might already be aware that calf value decreases as we go throughout the year and is typically at its lowest somewhere through September and December and October is historically when we see a lot of weaning, a lot of calves that are marketed and we see a, a, one of the lowest uh, prices that we receive for cattle in that time of the year. Um, and then over here is the feeder price, which itself is overall less typically than what we see on a calf price. But it is the greatest in January. And this is for the prices that are paid in feeder. These would be cattle that would enter into the feedlot. So um, if we were thinking about this, about integrating calves into a cover crop grazing system, if we bought five, if we buy 500 pound calves in October, that's when they're the they're, they're lowest price, like using that five year average pricing, we'd spend about $866 a head for those animals. If we did, what I think is a relatively conservative estimate of the gains that we could achieve in about a in about a 90 day window. I think we could see, I think we could easily recognize somewhere around a six that we could take those 500 pound animals. We put about 135 pounds on those. We have a bunch of animals that weigh 635 pounds after 90 days or in this, uh, in our little thought experiments areas in January. This also corresponds with our highest feeder price. And if we can get them sold for the calf price again, that's even better. But that would, if we use the feeder price, we're at $1,000, we're at $1,052 per head. If we qualify for incentive programs, if we talk to and uh, receive some of these incentive programs that are associated with this, um, that's gonna cover our seed costs. So effectively we have nearly no feed costs associated with these gains. And then if we use those, that largest stocking rate that um, from the data that I just showed you, this will result, we'd have a stocking rate of about 1.85 head per acre. So if we think of this as far as economic returns on a per acre basis, we'd have somewhere in the neighborhood of 300, with a little bit more than $340 an acre that we could be able to recognize just in calf gains, especially in these, um, these, uh, mixture, these cover crop mixtures. We also need to, there's also another benefit, part of the reason why there's an incentive associated with with cover crops and maybe an, an, an advantage when we integrate grazing is that when we graze brassica based cover crops, we might have an ability to have our cake and eat it too. So recently, and some of you might be aware of this, is one of the major uh, fast food chains um, released a commercial that expresses concern about methane production from cattle. The majority of methane production from cattle uh, actually comes from grazing animals, those that are fed forage-based diets. So the ones that we're talking about that would be in this experiment, and methane's a natural end product that associated with fermentation in the rumen. And, it, and it's of concern when we talk about food products that are produced from cattle. So 
remember we discussed nitrate and there's this nitrate toxicity. The reason why we see a nitrate toxicity in cattle that are naive to nitrates, where they're eating plants where they haven't received any nitrate intake prior to that, and then they're forced into a diet that contains relatively high amounts of nitrates, which brassicas would be in that warning level that we talked about. They'd be right there in the middle. Um, typically, if we're talking about cattle that have never seen nitrates before, we'd be concerned if the whole diet was comprised of nothing but brassica. Um, typically we think of that 0.15% as being, or 0.15 parts per million, excuse me, being an issue where we'd start to see some nitrate toxicity. And part of the problem with that is because nitrate in the rumen, in the first compartment of the gastrointestinal tract of cattle, is very rapidly reduced to this thing down here. So through this chemical process of reduction, it turns into this thing called nitrite. Nitrite actually binds blood um, more with greater affinity than does oxygen. So it creates this anemia. That, that we typically see. So it's generally classified by a blueness around uh, some of the soft mucosa, like the eyelids and, and uh, gums of the cattle. And in, in severe cases, it can be fatal and um, from basically a hypoxia. However, when, we, when cattle are incre increase their amount of nitrate intake gradually, we can actually, there's, there seems to be relatively no limit of nitrate that can actually be consumed and then reduced further all the way down to ammonia. That's important because ammonia can be utilized by the bacteria that live in the stomach of the rumen to make protein. And then that protein can be used by the cow to make protein either in meat or milk. And so this is important because there's another reduction process where carbon dioxide is reduced down to this thing, methane, which is what everybody's concerned about. So this, if we, when the rumen's adapted to reducing nitrate to ammonia, that actually is much more favorable. They prefers to do that in comparison of reducing carbon dioxide to methane. So in other words, when this happens, we see a reduction in the over, overall amount of methane that's produced. So we think that there's an opportunity where we can not only capture rapid values from deciding to utilize cover crops in a grazing system, but also to improve the sustainability of, of beef and overall cattle production associated with that. So here at the University of Missouri, we're actively seeking opportunities that'll help us better understand how to capture value from and improve sustainability of food production by combining cover crop forages in to grazing systems with cattle. And we'll keep you updated as we make new discoveries. However, until then, feel free to contact me with any questions. Uh, I can be reached relatively easy by my phone and email, which can both be, which are both found on this slide. So thank you for your time.